Good morning from La Crescenta. It's Palm Sunday. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious loving God, we bow before you seeking your grace this morning. Be with each of us as we worship you this hour. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let's sing. Okay. 
Hello, welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here. We can't wait to meet the person that the PNC has chosen to be our new pastor. Our candidating weekend is scheduled for April 22nd through 23rd. Be sure to save those dates for a reception Saturday, April 22nd from 2 to 5 p.m. in Koopman's Hall to meet the candidate and family. They'll then preach at a joint worship service in the sanctuary on Sunday, April 23rd, followed by a congregational meeting. And don't worry, you'll be receiving more detailed information about the candidate and their family a few days before that weekend via regular mail and through email. We hope you'll join us for this exciting time in our church. We are looking forward to big crowds for our two Easter services next Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Since we're expecting lots of visitors at both services, if you are willing and able, please consider parking down the street and taking a short walk to the sanctuary. We cannot wait to celebrate with all of you. All right, that's it for this week. Let's continue on with worship. Give up. 
Please join me now for corporate prayer of confession. Father God, we thank you for the ability to come together, to unify even over this virtual space, to celebrate, celebrate Palm Sunday this day. Lord, I thank you that we can remember who you are, that you are our King and you are our Savior, that we can shout along with the ages, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we thank you for your glories, who you are. Lord, we come before you today and we acknowledge that there are ways that we have not lived according to the good way you're set in front of us. Many ways we have chosen what is convenient. We've chosen what is easy. We have chosen what's according to our way rather than seeing your way, the good way that you have placed in front of us, the path of flourishing, the path of true life. I thank you, Lord, that through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, we have attained forgiveness once for all. And Lord, that we now are able to enter your family, to listen to your instructions. So God, I ask that you would guide us. Guide us to worship you not only with our mouth, but with our very lives. Aid us in looking down that pathway of righteousness and walking down that road in step with you. Be our vision today, God. Be our wisdom today, God. Bless every person who has come to watch this service to participate in worship of you. Would you be with us all? It's in your good name I do pray. Amen. Well, it's good to see you on this Palm Sunday. I hope you're well as we've completed our series in Nehemiah. And today is really a fitting way to celebrate Palm Sunday as a continuation of some of those same ideas. And you'll, you'll see that as we go today. Um, what I am reading is I'm reading uh, one of the versions of the Palm, uh, Palm Sunday story and it's the Gospel of Luke. And what's important to know about this story is this is recorded in all four Gospels. Anytime a story from Jesus' life is in all four Gospels, that's a real clue that this is one of the really important events in the life of Jesus. And obviously this was. It was really the culmination of his earthly ministry. So I'm going to read this passage. This is Luke chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 28. So let's hear God's word together. This is what it says. Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, 
If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you so much for uh, this passage of Scripture, your holy word, that helps us know what happened as Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to its culmination. And on this entry point into Holy Week, one of the very most important weeks in the entire year for us as believers in Jesus, God, as we celebrate this triumphant entry into Jerusalem, God, we pray that you would use this passage to speak to us where we are at this moment in our lives as we celebrate and we remember, Jesus, what you've done for us in going to the cross and rising from the dead. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing we need to know about this passage that I've just read is this passage is part of a larger narrative. This narrative begins at the beginning of chapter 19. We picked it up in verse 28. And what I want to do is I want to go back to the beginning of chapter 19 in order to set the context so you understand, we can understand more fully what's going on here and what Jesus has set up, how Jesus orchestrated uh, the time when he was to be revealed as the Messiah publicly. And you see it in how he approaches this moment. And so I'm going to read. I'm just going to read in the beginning of chapter 19. Listen to this and, and notice as you hear these words how Jesus is being very in, intentional about how he is preparing for his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So Jesus is approaching Jerusalem and it says Jesus entered Jericho. He was passing through. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. And we remember this story. It's a well-known story. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because of his short stature, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. And since Jesus was coming that way, and when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Remember, tax collectors were seen as traitors by the Jewish people. And Jesus, he selects Zacchaeus in the crowd and he points him out and he says, I need to be in your house, Zacchaeus, which was scandalous. It was one of these things Jesus did that made no sense to religious Jews. And notice what happens when the people are saying this. They're muttering as a crowd about the scandalous event in Jesus' life, it says Jesus, or excuse me, Zacchaeus, he stood up and he said to the Lord, Jesus, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Now, remember that statement. Jesus is making a statement and what he's doing in the life of Zacchaeus publicly that culminates with this declaration when he says the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And who are the lost? That's you. That's me. That's every person that's ever been born into this sin sick world. So that was the purpose of the Messiah, Jesus. And now the story goes on. Notice, while they were listening to this, what happens with Zacchaeus, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. And because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once, he said, and he tells a story like Jesus often did. He says, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king 
and then return. Who do you think Jesus is talking about? That this man of royal descent, Jesus is speaking about himself. This man of noble birth, of descent, went to a distant country to have himself appointed king. And Jesus was the king of kings, remember, as he's approaching Jerusalem. So what does he do, this, this man, in the story of Jesus? He calls ten of his servants, and he gave them ten minas, a portion of money. And he, and he said, put this money to work until I come back. But his subjects, now notice this phrase. This is very important to the story of what we see happen when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. His subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him as he's off to be crowned king, saying, we don't want this man to be our king. And hold on to that thought, that that attitude of the people saying, we don't want this man to be our king. Then he goes on, Jesus says, but he was made king because he was king. And then he returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they'd gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. And the king said, well done, my good servant. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your money has earned, your mina has earned five more. The master said, You, take charge of five cities. So he commends him. And then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina. I've kept it. I laid it away in a piece of cloth. I hid it. Because I was afraid of you, because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in, and you reap what you did not sow. So this this evil servant was part of this group that said, we don't want this man to be our king. And notice how the king replies. He said, I will judge you by your own words you wicked servant you knew did you and he's using his own misconception of who this king was you knew did you that i'm a hard man taking out what i did not put in reaping what i did not sow why then did you put money on the deposit so when i came back i could have collected it with interest then he said to those standing by take his mean away from him give it to the one who has ten Sir, they replied, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, in other words, the ones who come to understand who Jesus really is, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, this one who is getting me all wrong, who sees me as something that I'm not, when he says, I was afraid of you because you're a, you're a, a terrible master he said even that person what they have will be taken away from them and then he closes and this is jesus meek and mild says those enemies of mine the ones who do not understand who i am as the king of kings and lord of lords those who do not want me to be king over them bring them here and kill them in front of me. It's like, wow. I mean, did you know Jesus ever said anything like this? I mean, he's being very harsh, but he's using for judgment the misconception that people had about him. So he tells this story really about himself and the two different groups of people, those who understood who he was, who gladly served him and who received the the riches that come with serving serving the true King Jesus and those who did not understand who he was, who misunderstood, who saw him as somebody they would never want to have as Lord over them. And there was a, a serious consequence because of that. And so then after that, it says, the very next thing you see in this text, it says, after Jesus had said this story. So Jesus 
He encounters Zacchaeus and he makes a declaration, I came to seek and save the lost. That's why I came was to help you. And then he tells a story about how so many people misunderstood who Jesus really was, just like people in our day who missed the fact that Jesus came to seek and to save us, to help us. And then he enters Jerusalem. He enters Jerusalem, and then he orchestrates this way in which he is honored and celebrated by his disciples. And, and you can see both the, the divinity of Jesus in the story. You see the fact that he knows exactly what's happening before it's going to happen. He tells his disciples, go ahead. You're going to find this colt that's never been ridden in a certain place, in a certain home. It'll be waiting for you. Untie it. When the master of that house comes and asks, why are you taking my, my colt? Tell them the master needs it. Then that's exactly what happened. They found it just as Jesus said. They, they had had this encounter with the owner of the home. He asked, why are you taking my animal? And they just did what Jesus said. Our master needs it. They bring the cult to him. And then what they do is they reenact what every king of Israel went through when they, they entered into becoming king. You see it in the life of Solomon. You see it in other kings in the Old Testament. The same act of taking a cult, a donkey, and putting their king on that donkey, and then spreading their clothes and palm branches on the ground in front of them as they made their way into the city of the great king, Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Jesus is orchestrating. And, and in the past, whenever they wanted to make him king, he would say, no, my time has not come. Well, he knew his time had come. And as Jesus said, he was fulfilling all righteousness. He was doing everything the scriptures before in the Old Testament said had to happen as the Messiah would come into Jerusalem as the true king, the king of all kings. And, and so we see this in what's happening. And I just want to I want to read a couple passages related to this. The first one is in Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says this. And this is one of the prophets. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then in Psalm 118, we hear the very words that the, the disciples they exclaimed and they celebrated as Jesus came in using these words from Psalms like this from the Old Testament. This is Psalm 118, beginning in verse 20. It says, This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. And that makes me think of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus, that he came to seek and to save us and to rescue us and to allow us to experience the life we were made for. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it in this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. And this is what they said, Lord, save us. That's what Hosanna literally means. Save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The very words they chanted and, and they, they yelled out before Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. And it said, they go on and say, From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So there's this image of this, this parade celebrating the coming of the Messiah, which is exactly what Jesus is enacting in Palm Sunday. And then it ends by saying, you are my God, I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So the, the Jewish people, they knew these scriptures. And so they are pulling from these texts, from their people, from their history, as Jesus coming in, and they're clearly declaring him the Messiah publicly. And what is Jesus doing? He's embracing it. He's orchestrating it. He's saying, now is the moment in my earthly ministry when I am revealing who I actually am. 
And so what happens? In our text, back in Luke, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what, what part are they playing in relation to the parable Jesus told right before he entered Jerusalem? They are living out in their life, in their resistance to Jesus, the very thing Jesus said when certain people said, we don't want this man to be our king. And then what they said also about, you, you are not the person you say you are. You are not a good king. We do not want to worship you. And Jesus says, remember in that parable, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servants. And in the parable, he says, those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Jesus had just said that right before these enemies of his, the Messiah, as he's coming into Jerusalem, are doing the very thing he had just said that his enemies would do, that they would oppose him, that they would not want to see him for who he was, they were blinded. And so notice what Jesus says in response to them when they're telling him to tell his disciples to stop worshiping you. You should not be worshiped. He says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. All creation will worship me. And he's saying to them right in front of everyone, I am the Messiah. I am the son of the living God. I am the fulfillment of all the prophecies. And there is absolutely no way I'm going to do anything to quell this celebration of who I am as I come into Jerusalem. Now, the one difference we see here in Jesus, he rebukes the, leader, the, the Pharisees. He says, no, I'm not going to do what you ask. But the very next thing it says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, what did he do? He wept. He wept. You know, I've titled this sermon on this Palm Sunday, The Heart of God. The Heart of God. Because Jesus was God, everything he did, everything he said, expressed the true heart of God. So Jesus here as the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, is openly revealing who he was as the, the promised Messiah coming to seek and save all people of all time. And he's, he's now gone public. But because most of the people in that city, J Jerusalem, where he was coming to give his life in order to save, literally save us from our sin, most of the people were like the Pharisees. And we know that we know the story and how it ends, that the very people in this crowd, other than a very small handful, all turned on him. And not very long after that, they were crying instead of Hosanna, they were crying, crucify, crucify. He knew that was coming, just like he knew this day was coming because he was divine. He was the son of the living God, even though he was also human. And so knowing what was coming, even as they're worshiping him, knowing that they would all turn on him and he would, they would have to turn on him for him to fulfill his calling of going to the cross. What did he do? The heart of God broke. God's heart broke. He wept. And he said, if you, even you, had only known in this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. And, you know, I, I try to imagine what Jesus, God, the Son, was feeling in that moment as he was coming in Jerusalem, even as he was being worshipped, that he was weeping because he knew that the people, their eyes were blinded. And so for us today, as we think about this first Palm Sunday and what happened and how Jesus orchestrated this and the response of his heart when he wept, over the people of that time. And I think over the people of the world, I think God's heart still breaks when we don't see God for who God is. When we have 
when we are deceived into believing something about God that's not true about God, that we, we say like these people in the parable, we don't want you to be our king. We don't see you as good and loving and trustworthy. And so we're not going to let you lead us. We're not going to give you our life. In fact, we are going to resist you. And any time we in our life are deceived in that way, we're blinded and we're misled by things that are not true about God. So we miss God and we don't follow God and we go our own way. God's heart breaks and God weeps. I believe in even now. And so as we go into this very last portion of Lent, we're at the very end of Lent, the season of prayer for reflection. I, I want to ask you to make good use of these final days that culminate with Monday, Thursday, remembering and celebrating Jesus' last supper with his disciples as he's on his way to the cross. And then as we celebrate and we remember Good Friday, God's sacrifice for our sin. And so we have today, we have Monday, we have Tuesday, we have Wednesday, and then we have Monday, Thursday, and then we have Good Friday, and then we have Holy Saturday before we celebrate on Easter. And so instead of rushing to the celebration of Easter, again, I encourage us, to continue in a spirit of reflection, asking ourselves, what needs to die in me that is misleading me? What ways am I blinded to the truth of who God is, just the way people were when Jesus f walked into Jerusalem on this first Palm Sunday? Where am I vulnerable? Where am I not open or responsive or receptive to the movement of God in my life today? So what, what needs to die in me so I can see and understand and embrace the gifts that God has for me? And also, what needs to come alive in me this year at this time that maybe is dead that God wants to bring to life? So I just leave those questions. What needs to die in me that's not of God? What needs to come alive in me that God wants to bring into my life at this time? And I invite us to think about that and make good use of these days so that when we get to Easter next Sunday, we can truly celebrate the amazing work that God's done in our life as we see and we hear and we respond and we embrace the gifts of God as his first disciples did. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for this day in the year when we remember and we celebrate your coming into Jerusalem, that, that moment in your earthly ministry when you knew it was time to reveal yourself for who you actually were before the entire world in Jerusalem, that you were the fulfillment of all the prophecies. You were the son of the living God. You were the promised Messiah who had come to seek and save the lost each of us, God, each of us who are lost apart from you. God, thank you for how you have this heart for us, that you are always in pursuit of us, that we might be drawn to you, that we might see you for who you are, so that our hearts would be broken open and anything in us that's resistant to you, like the Pharisees were, that which breaks your heart, God, that you would be able to break our hearts open and you would be free to reveal those things in us that we need to let you take to the cross with you to crucify, to let die, to let go of, and then to allow you, God, to give us the gifts, the things you want to add to our lives that would enable us to experience more of the good life the goodness that we see in that parable when you commended your faithful servants who understood the truth about who you are and invested their life for the things that had to do with you and your kingdom. God, I pray that that would be more true of us this Easter so that as we go through this week, this holy week, God, you could finish the work that's needed right now in our lives. 
that work of awareness, confession, and receptivity of your gifts. So when we gather on Easter, we can truly celebrate all that you're doing in our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have been both encouraged and challenged in your faith this morning. Next Sunday is Easter. We encourage you to join us at one of our two worship services. Come ready to lift your voice in celebration and praise starting at 9 o'clock as our band, The Blessed, fills the sanctuary in song. Pastor Mike will have a special Easter message at that service and again at 11 o'clock when a brass fanfare begins our classic service with choir, organ, and congregational singing. I'm excited. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Thank you.